All right. Well, thank you um, for those of you who have joined, and I'm uh, glad you saw my message yesterday. Uh, um, apologies for any confusion. Our uh, Randy Carter left us in May, and we uh, forgot to update have her update uh, this series before she left. So I wasn't able to update the calendar invite, and hope that um, I was hoping the message would be clear enough to update calendar invites and I'm glad to see at least we've got a few people on today but this meeting will be recorded for those who aren't um, able to attend today so um, I'm happy to introduce Carolina Robert Santana from um, the Department of Health in Rhode Island she's a deputy chief of EMS there and also um, heads up the EMS for Children program and was a part of our 2018-2019 pediatric emergency care coordinator learning collaborative with the EIC so she will be presenting to you today on um, experiences through that collaborative and um, all of the amazing progress she's made um, since then. So I'm going to um, turn my video off now and hand, the, hand this presentation over to Carolina. Uh, thank you so much for agreeing to present for us today. Thank you, Rachel. And hello, everyone. As Rachel mentioned, my name is Carolina Robert Santana. I'm the Deputy Chief of Emergency Medical Services at the Rhode Island Department of Health and the EMS for Children Program Manager. I, I've been in this role for eight years, um, which makes me officially the eldest EMS C manager in New England. So I want to take a moment um, to review my acknowledgments and disclaimers. Um, I operate under the HRSA grant, and the content presented here does not represent the official views of HRSA. So today I'm going to be presenting various aspects of the PEC program in Rhode Island. Um, I want to start by saying that a lot of this work was completed in collaboration with a Brown University scholar, Olivia Selfhorst, and the Rhode Island EMS for Children Advisory Committee, led by Dr. Linda Brown and Captain John Potvin. As many of you know, and as Rachel just mentioned, Rhode Island was one of the nine states that received the PEC LC grant. Um, for today's presentation, we'll start by looking briefly at the data, reviewing the Rhode Island PEC LC model, the process of in-state regulation, and we will also review the outcomes of the project. Please feel free to post questions in the chat, and I will do my best to leave um, some time at the end for question and answers. And if I can't get to your question today, I will do my best to provide a response in writing, if possible. So the first thing we're gonna look at briefly is the data. Um, so during the 2017-2018 EMS agency survey, Rhode Island reported that 13 out of the 57 EMS agencies had a PEC. After the PEC LC efforts and the work that we did with the PEC LC grant, um, Pediatric Emergency Care Coordinator Learning Collaborative efforts, um, and I'll say PEC LC from now on, 43 out of 64 reported a PEC. Or if we use, as you can see here, the one-to-one -one analysis, 37 out of 53 EMS agencies were reporting a PEC after the grant, which means that we were able to see a significant increase. Before we go into the evaluation of the program, I wanted to provide a refresh of the model. What happened with the PEC LC grant in Rhode Island is that we asked 40 EMS agencies to send a pediatric representative to training so that they can become certified pre-hospital PECs. Although 40 PECs started the program, only 25 completed the full 40 hours. The, the curriculum that we required at that time was a 40-hour curriculum that included PALS, PEP, family center care, and simulation. And at the end of the program, each person who completed the program would receive a two-year PEC certification. At this time, that certification ends December 31st of 2021. And so this is our first graduating class. During EMS week and EMS recognition day of 2019, we certified 25 PECs in a special ceremony at the Rhode Island State House. So during the PEC program, we worked with the state to ensure that pediatric emergency care coordination was placed in regulation as a required position for licensing requirements. You can see in this slide the regulatory language that we use. In essence, ambulance services are required to identify an EMS pediatric emergency care coordinator, and we define that role as the individual who ensures that the ambulance service and its providers are prepared to care for ill and injured children.
to achieve this, to be able to put the regulation in place, we had to present a fiscal note to the general public, the Ambulance Service Advisory Board, and the governor. We estimated that at a minimum, a PECS duty would co um, constitute one work hour per week or 52 work hours per year for a total of $2,857 per city town licensee. Now we wanna remember that Rhode Island is a very small town, uh, ah, state, <laughs> Rhode Island is a very small state with um, only about 200,000 children. And so we know that some agencies are currently investing much more than this on their staffing. But in general, to present the fiscal note, we were able to um, present that it would be cost around $151,442 to institute pets in each EMS agency in Rhode Island. So as I mentioned before, during our um, program, we were able to train 40 pets of which 25 completed a certification program. Our scholar conducted an evaluation study to assess the effectiveness of the PEC training program. And so today I'm going to, I'm going to be able to review the results with everyone here. Since this was a qualitative study where semi-structured interviews were performed, we're gonna see a lot of direct quotes from those interviews. It is important to highlight that out of the 25 certified pets, only 22 participated in the interview. The predominant team themes that we found included agency characteristic considerations, changes in provider perceptions of pediatric care, and suggestions for future pet programs. The results um, of, the, of the qualitative study showed significant variability between the characteristics of agencies in Rhode Island and should be considered when planning future training programs like the PET program. Most of the significant feedback concerned volunteer departments who noted difficulty in attending PET trainings. Many volunteer pre-hospital providers have other paid employment and had to take time off or use vacation days to attend the PEC training. One participant said, we had to take vacation time or PTO or whatever, so we could attend the class. That was the only drawback of the class if you're on a volunteer department. The scheduling barrier for volunteer agencies was also noted to be a common reason why many other volunteer agencies in the state were not able to send a representative to participate in the Rhode Island EMSC PEC training system, uh, program. Meanwhile, in paid volunteer combination departments, many providers were able to come in their paid capacity or appoint a paid individual to attend the PEC training sessions and meetings. The rural agencies tended to face similar challenges to volunteer departments, such as limited personnel and lack of resources, as there was significant overlap between rural and volunteer agency characteristics. However, rural departments have a lower average um, number of calls with a particular lack of pediatric patient exposure. One of the participants said, my department is a rural department. We don't see a high volume of calls. And as you can imagine, a very small portion of those are pediatric. So when they do come through and they are very serious, I worry about what happens if my level of expertise is not on the truck. To assess the impact of the program, interview questions inquired about provider comfort level, before and after participating in the program for participants and other members of their um, respective agencies. So pre-PEC training program, before the, of the program, most participants, about 77%, described either their own feelings or members of their agencies as uneasy, unprepared, apprehensive, anxious, intimidated, and lacking overall comfort when going on a pediatric call. These feelings were attributed to a lack of pediatric training, low pediatric call volume, and lack of application and experience in treating pediatric patients. One participant stated, usually guys are nervous about pediatric calls, especially if they're bad calls. If it's routine, it's not such a big deal. But when we get a bad PD, because we do so few of them, everybody gets their heightened sense of anxiety whenever a call comes in for pediatrics. And relating this back to the previous slide, we found that the consequences of apprehension from providers seem to be more obvious in volunteer agencies because those providers could choose not to respond. 
And so one participant actually stated that the tones come in and people listen and it's something like two-year-old seizure. Everyone takes three giant step backwards and we have a very few personnel show up for the call. However, just wanna clarify that there are other agencies and paid providers that would respond in those situations. The disparity in pediatric education and comfort among providers is cause for concern and particular attention should be given to agencies with uh, volunteer members. That's one of our learnings. Um, actually, let me talk about post PEC training programs. So following the run and EMSD PEC training program, 86% of participants reported improvements in their comfort level with pediatric patients. The opinions were largely homogeneous with comments about either their own or a member of uh, or a member of their agency feeling confidence, their parents' comfort, specific skills improvement, better awareness, and enhanced utilization of pediatric specific equipment, such as Brazil tapes and PD wheels um, for weight-based medication dosing. And so participants noted um, the, uh, the change in their approach to training colleagues following the program with a more inclusive focus on pediatric patients. So for example, a participant mentioned, since I've done um, the PEC training program, I have really tried to include a lot more pediatric information. We'll do like half of the lecture will be on like adults and then the other half of the lecture now will be on peds. Or if it's hands-on, we'll do half and half and we'll have one or two PED scenario along with an adult scenario. Many participants also commented on the influence and security of their new expertise brought, um, and the ability to bring that to their department. Um, a person said, I think having a go-to educator at our department in general is going to be a huge step forward. So there was significant um, positive feedback about working through dynamic life-like life um, simulations, using the simulation equipment, consulting with emergency physicians, and listening to the advice of pediatricians and pediatric nurses. The involvement of hospital providers was noted as a highlight of the program because it allowed the pets to learn directly from experts in the field. Um, a lot of them uh, agreed that collaboration and understanding between emergency pre-hospital and hospital providers can be valuable in enhancing the continuity of care for pediatric patients, especially in acute emergency situations where a pediatric patient is involved. So the third theme was suggestions for future PEC training programs. Um, one of the main goals of the evaluation focused on gathering these suggestions for future PEC training programs from participants. The most common suggestion was inclusion of a clinical based rotation to allow PEC students to interact with pediatric patients with a focus on symptom recognition and appropriate responses. Um, they all, most of them agreed that the low volume of calls was um, a major contrib um, contributing factor to the apprehension and unprepared feelings reported by pre-hospital providers prior to the PEC program. And so participants discussed the benefit of working either in an observational capacity in an emergency room or in pediatricians' offices um, for routine procedures or simply taking vital signs. And so participants believe that this basic exposure to patients would be valuable to experience um, before experiencing pediatric um, patients on a call. Uh, one of the providers said, I would rather the students touch patients and get clinical experience with someone overseeing them versus doing it for the first time on a patient, doing whatever procedure on a patient for the first time in the field. We recognize that this would likely require a significant level of coordination and agreements to work with live patients, but the interaction with pediatric patients would be um, something that all participants considered that they would appreciate and would find beneficial for future programs. Another important training suggestion just make sure I'm on the right left slide, yeah. Another important training suggestion by PEC participants was enhanced tools and information for the dissemination of the materials to the members of their agency. The education experience of PECs varied widely within the sample. Many of the younger PECs expressed concern about lacking information about the best instructional methods and hoped um, that the PEC program would also include specific teaching materials and approaches. One participant stated, I wish there was more put on how do we better train and better promote pediatric care in our own service besides just being like an instructor for one of the big main trainings. And we understood what he was talking about. 
The trainings um, that were mentioned, such as PALS and PEP, included some instructional methods, but an, an additional component could include individualized um, training planning and methods for providers to use based on the specific characteristic of their agency. A few participants inquired about pediatric training equipment, such as mannequins and pediatric specific equipment to aid in specific um, or effective pediatric training following the PET training program. However, this is not always plausible for agencies with limited resources and training budgets as, as is common in volunteers and rural agencies we found. So several participants discussed the need for Brazil tapes and PD wheels that could be provided at the completion of the training and utilized during dissemination training. One participant suggested it would be really nice to see in further implementations of this class if maybe designing a pediatric gear bag could be part of the program and if there could be money allocated for that. With that, they could take home to their home agencies that PD bag. Although these supplies are helpful um, for pediatric training, they can also be kept in pediatric assigned bags and employed during pediatric runs. Understanding of the practices and how to use pediatric specific uh, equipment, as we all know, um, within this realm can make a difference in comfort and preparedness for pre-hospital providers. A few participants noted a major cause of, uh, for anxiety among providers was pe pediatric medication dosage measurements because they're based on weight and involve some medication math. Um, that's how they called it. And so there was concern that most pediatric patients or their parents do not know their weight in kilograms or provide unreliable estimates. So providers are responsible for the conversion from pounds and determining the correct dosage on the, uh, of the medication based on that unreliable weight. Um, needless to say, in emergent situations, estimating weight for medication dosing can be very stressful for pre-hospital providers. And we understand that this can contribute to potential medical errors, which is why they express that as one of the concerns. And so participants discuss the pressure this computing can put on providers, especially inexperienced providers. One participant said the stress of trying to come up with learning about medication math for pediatric patients, it's just too much. If they don't have the previous experience, I think maybe even a separate training for just that and then go into scenarios where they maybe just learned it would be helpful. This suggestion aligns with the pediatric specific tool exposure Suggestion to increase familiarity with Braslow tapes and PD wheels and other dosing devices during training to minimize the potential errors when doing medication math. A few participants expressed concern about um, a lack of training and acknowledgement about children with behavioral health challenges or special needs. And so participants wanted to be prepared for even the most challenging of pediatric calls with one participant saying, I know like with disabilities and stuff, with kids is a harder thing. You get the kids with the Asperger's, the other issues like that. I'd like to see more of that incorporated into the training because you're getting more of that population and every kid is different. And so a lot of the participants recognize that behavioral and mental health needs are very unique and add to the complexity of pediatric calls. The participants believe that providers should be exposed to some basic training and skills to properly treat these patients with high quality care. Just the same as all pediatric patients, either through the EMS training or as a supplementary component to the PET training program. Overall, the Rhode Island EMS for Children PEC training program received significant praise and participants spoke highly of their experience. The barriers to these programs were consistent with past studies conducted to identify the needs for similar training programs when it comes to agency characteristics and the gaps that currently exist in terms of education. Um, participants did express that there was some overlap within the material, so they felt that there was some overlap between PALS and the PEP course which might discourage other participants um, to attend if they felt that the training was redundant. Many participants hope to incorporate the pediatric portion of the training into their existing scheduled trainings. 
And there were conversations about common dissemination challenges that included concerns about cost, time commitment, and scheduling. Participants made suggestions such as offering weekend classes, especially for volunteer agencies, to encourage attendance and setting aside funding to provide training um, equipment for PEC dissemination trainings. This could also serve as an incentive for high-end provide, provider interest and PEC enrollment and attendance across the state. Those were some of their suggestions. Another, um, which I think was very positive, um, but possibly unintended result of the program was the opportunity for providers from different agencies to network and discuss their training strategies and organizations. So we had a lot of discussion from that first training all the way to the last training on how, you know, my agency's different, we do it this way, would this work for you, would this work for me, and a lot of that, those type of conversations. Although not a thematic result, interagency discussion um, could potentially be utilized to connect agencies to share resources and training personnel to further extend pediatric knowledge and skills. And we actually leveraged that during the training um, to kind of encourage others to move forward by saying this agency is similar to yours, so you want to connect with the pet there. The consultation with emergency physicians, as I mentioned before, pediatricians and pediatric nurses built an appreciation and an understanding of the link between their pre-hospital and hospital roles. And so recognition of this continuity of care, mutual understanding between the providers is remained essential throughout the course, and we will definitely consider it for future courses. So what did the Rhode Island EMS for Children program learn? Um, what are our future learning objectives? How are we going to move forward with this program? So what we learn from the program is that our PECs consider that classes like PALS, PEP, and TEBI, and other programs out there are crucial. They, they have a lot of good information, um, but they also want to learn how to create their own training curriculum that is adaptable to their EMS agency and its culture. So we heard a lot of like, how do I build objectives that are related to pediatric? How do I um, bring forth a curriculum that's perhaps not eight hours long, but that can satisfy the requirements of the Department of Health and the, and the EMS for Children program. We also learned that um, there is an interest in promoting both simulation and hands-on training to ensure that providers have adequate exposure to pediatric patients annually. And, um, and, you know, this was very interesting for us because we were able to learn that people actually do want that exposure um, but that sometimes is very difficult to obtain when you have, you know, you do 200 calls a year and one is pediatric in three years, for example. And then the last thing that we learned was that um, we will, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, um, some work that we did after, um, but just for everyone's education at the first meeting where we had the 40 EMS agencies um, join, we asked what would be a good equipment um, bag or any ideas on equipment, and no one really had an answer. I think people were shy. They didn't want to tell me how to spend my money, um, but throughout the program, no one had an answer on how to assess, how to best assess the fact that we had limited resources but wanted to provide some relief related to pediatric equipment. So it was great feedback um, from this um, evaluation to see PEC suggest sort of like a training course, an equipment bag training course, or how do you put together your equipment bag? What are the required um, pediatric equipment that should be in your bag? And, and make it sort of like a class instead of saying, here's equipment, um, to, but kind of make this a, a, a potential solution um, to get everyone involved and, and, and teach everyone how to use their pediatric bag and what's in it. And so in 2020, um, we were approved by HRSA to utilize carryover funds from the PEC-LC to award EMS agencies um, with a PEC. Uh, we gave preference to those agencies that had a certified PEC, a mini award that would allow them to implement strategies that would enhance um, pediatric education and promote EMS agencies to develop a process that requires EMS providers to physically demonstrate the correct use of pediatric specific equipment via skill station, simulation event, or field encounter. No, I am not quoting performance measure number 30. And so we actually had um, 22 
EMS agencies apply. Um, 16 agencies were awarded $4,900, $4,900, and only 15 EMS agencies completed all award goals. So we had six agencies um, who purchased equipment, um, developed their own curriculum, and trained approximately 166 providers. And then we also had nine EMS agencies who purchased the hand heavy system and participated in training with hand heavy. We had about 362 providers who did that process. And this data is not final um, because that this grant, this um, award opportunity just ended in March of 2021. And so we have agencies who did some training after in April. And so we're still learning what those numbers look like and what the outcome of those trainings were. Other opportunities that we found um, specifically for the 25 certified PACs, but obviously opening it up to all PACs in Rhode Island um, is involvement in the targeted issues grant that we have. Um, the, we have eight PACs currently working in the EMSC Telehealth Collaborative. And we also have um, some of our PECs who are who will become um, PEC mentors during the workforce development. Um, I don't know if that's a collaborative or something, the work, the, the PEC workforce development program. And so we have been reaching out to all of our PECs, the 25 that completed the certified, but obviously every other PEC in Rhode Island to make sure that they have the opportunity. I didn't include this here, but they also participated in the New England um, training that was created um, back in 2020. And so we we made sure that at least twice a year they have opportunities to continue to train, to continue to learn, and to continue to promote pediatric education within their EMS agency. And so I warned Rachel that um, this presentation was very, very short. Um, I do see two comments in the chat, I believe, but um, I want to open it up for if anyone has any questions um, and we can have a discussion. Yes, amazing work, Carolina. Thank you so much. Um, everybody, uh, you're able to unmute yourselves or use the chat box and I can monitor that um, and uh, read them back to Carolina if you've got questions or comments for her. So Beth Gingerella um, is one of our pets. She sent me a direct message, but um, she said, fantastic job capturing this program. Thank you, Beth, for um, joining us um, in this um, meeting today. Don't be shy, answer any questions. Oh, go ahead. Caroline, I was gonna uh, reiterate the point that you made in terms of some of the findings with your interviews and, um, and things that, in some of our, uh, uh, the PEC Target Issues Grant that Rhode Island is participating in and um, with Connecticut and then also here in Colorado, we had the focus and the training of really wanting the providers to use their pediatric bags is a, is a really important one. And yet at the same time, no one wants to open up their equipment. And, uh, and so having a pediatric bag that they know that they can use and open up stuff, maybe for thing, expired meds or, um, you know, airway equipment or whatever, is I think really key because they don't get the opportunity to truly practice and, um, and they won't do it if they're actually using the bag that they're supposed to carry with them. They're terrified of that. So it, it's a really interesting finding that you found as well. Yeah, and I think the pediatric equipment concept is very interesting because as I mentioned, like we were like, here, money, you know, what do you want? We'll buy anything for you. And and the answer was always like, uh, we don't know, we don't want to. But I found it interesting that for them to say, like, train us on how to open this bag, um, to recognize what equipment is in it, to sort of think, um, you know, so I was thinking like, all right, drill find your PD bag, you know, it's a sort of um, interaction with the EMS agencies um, so that they feel a little bit more motivated and, and, and to actually go and access that bag. Thank you for that. 
a uh, comment from Dwayne, great job. Uh, how do you see establishing a training program in a state with many more EMS agencies than Rhode Island? Yes, yes. the tiny Rhode Island shaming has started. Um, <laughs> you know, I've seen during the PEC LC, I think one of the values that we had was um, that we were able to see different models. I saw some states do regional efforts. Um, I saw some states, um, you know, focus whatever their EMS structure is. We are because we are such a, a tiny state. Um, we actually are able to to you. We have eighty six agencies, but only fifty three meet the criteria, and so we were able to do that. But I think there's a possibility for regional um if you want to focus on a specific region start there um so i think it de really depends on the agency i don't know i don't remember um what every other state because we did have new york um we had other kentucky other big states that had more agencies and that i think that's the approach or like sort of uh, uh, reaching out to designating specific PECs, like super PECs um, within those regions and trying to implement that. So Kyron no, is going, and there's no shaming here. So I'm sorry, <laughs> but it was just, it's an economy of scale where your numbers are manageable and some other states, including my own, we have the challenges and, and just wondering how, you know, we might be able to do it. And I like the super PEC or, you know, definitely the regional idea uh, has applications. Um, but I do like the super PEC, and I, I believe Kentucky had something like that yeah. where they had a, a kind of a regional leader that, yep. that, you know, not trying to reinvent the wheel and, and make things work where they've, you know, been shown successful. So that's just the reason for my question. And Carolina, having, oh, go ahead. Beth. Having attended the program um, and currently a nurse manager in an ED in Rhode Island as well, um, I do think that in larger states, this could be done on a regional basis um, and kind of pull the state together with some online curriculum using this lovely Zoom platform that we've developed over um, this wonderful COVID period so that they have the ability to interact through regions um, and form those connections because that was huge kind of through the grant and then have the localized hands-on piece be done in your individual regions, be it a super user of the program or um, individual regional hospitals who agree to do that hands-on sim piece. Thank you, Beth. And she's one of our star packs who Connecticut wants to steal, but I will not let them steal. Even if Connecticut is not stealing me. I live in Rhode <laughs> Island. <laughs> she needs to right, rename so herself. Ginger needs to rename uh, herself. I Ginger saw... be great. Ginger be great. Okay. Go ahead, Catherine. Um, no, just asking. So she had mentioned, I think she was trying to address that this was a um, like a hybrid. You did some of it online. And did you develop that content? Or did you did we so because of the PEC, because the PEC LC was such a short, um, like it was quick, right? We, right. we got the grant and we had to do everything right away. Um, I, I, I relied on PALS and PEP. So like things that are already standards and were already structured and we sort of just paid. We have a simulation center in Rhode Island. So we, we paid the simulation center to train everyone on PALS PEP. We did have our family advisor um, uh, develop the family center care. And then the simulation aspect was pulled from different scenarios. The family center care was online um, back in 2019 because of the short time frame. we couldn't get these people, they went to 40 hours of training. I was amazed, um, you know, that they were willing to do all those hours. Wow. They were really committed. And so the, the, we couldn't get them to go to the family center care. We wanted a full day conference. So we ended up doing an online, um, I think it was like two hour um, course for them to participate. So that, that unfortunately that did, that was something that wasn't up to the standard that we wanted it to um, but we still got amazing feedback because it did have an evaluation at the end and, and comments and suggestions. Um, so again, I did rely on the PALS PEP standardized courses um, for the scenario base. And this is one of the comments that somebody made that they wish that they would have received some sort of, um, even though PALS and PEP does have 
like this is how you instruct pals and pep. It, I, I feel like providers wanted to learn how to develop their own if needed. And so that was something that um, participants said that they wish that they could have learned a little bit more. Awesome, thank you. I might reach out to you, Heather. All right. Thanks. And a couple other comments um, from Cindy. Great job, Carolina. We also found that providing agencies with funding for training equipment was very positive for most EMS agencies. Others found the procurement, procurement within their agencies too cumbersome for the small funds and noting that they might return to regional training kits post COVID, um, but congratulations Rhode Island. And then um, Jason mentions that in Montana, we had 196 agencies engaged during the PEC Learning Collaborative and they broke the state down into three regions that aligned with the trauma regions, having the challenge of uh, geography. They also held regional trainings so folks could participate more easily. And I think uh, Jason could probably give you the number of Rhode Islands that could fit in Montana. <laughs> you see, there you go. <laughs> There's the Rhode Island. Yeah, so um, yeah, I remember that, Jason. Great, thank you for adding that. Um, yeah, so I, some people did have to rely on regional um, type of um, interactions to be able to achieve this. Um, and I wanted to mention to, to Cindy's comment, thank you, Cindy, for mentioning that we actually, at the end, I showed that we did that like many awards for equipment. Um, and that one agency, even though we award, awarded 16, that one agency that was not able to complete the requirements was because they couldn't get through their procurement process. Um, because it was a short three month um, grant. And so not grants, award, award. Um, and so they were not allowed to, they, were, they weren't, it wasn't enough time for them to do that. Any other questions, comments, Commissioner? Thank you everyone for the questions, I'm excited. Anybody else? Catherine loves the little state of Rhode Island. Thank you, yes, thank you. Well, um, if there's no other questions or comments, um, we don't need to hold on just because we've got the whole hour scheduled. Um, uh, I, I will say that I'm sure Carolina would be more than happy um, to answer any questions if they, if you think of something later, um, there's her contact information there. And um, just so you all know, I know we had this, scheduled again in November, um, but because we're starting the Workforce Development Collaborative next month, we're going to put this um, community of practice kind of on hiatus while we go through that collaborative and we'll pick back up again next summer once that collaborative is completed. So um, we will be sending an email out to this full group, um, uh, getting it all up and running again um, next year. So. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. And apologies for any confusion and those who might have um, had to join late because you didn't have the right link. But we will post uh, this uh, webinar recording on the EIC website, and I will get that email out as soon as it's up um, and viewable so you can catch the first part of Carolina's um, discussion. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.